I'm your host, Sharada Devi, of the Born to be Free podcast that serves as a bridge between the ancient and the new era, a confluence of opposites where all is seen as sacred and every experience is meant to catapult you into your supreme destiny. I'd like to start with a prayer dedicated to Saraswati. She is the goddess of knowledge. Let's do a little prayer to Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge, the goddess of words, so that there is clear communication and that there is a conversation and that I can convey what I want to convey, what I want to share with you. So if you want, join me and you can repeat after me. Aim Hrim Om Saraswati Namaha. That's a long one, I break it up. Aim Hrim Aim Hrim Om Saraswati Namaha. Saraswati Namaha. Namaha, my salutation, my invocation, my reverence to unto Saraswati, unto she who is Sar Saharasavati, with all flavors. She is the goddess of words, of this world, of knowledge. And Aim Harim Om are Bija mantras, our sacred seed mantras. And so let's do it two more times. Aim Harim Om. Aim Harim Om. Saraswati Namaha, Saraswati Namaha, Aim Hrim Om, Aim Hrim Om, Saraswati Namaha, Saraswati Namaha. And now the whole mantra, you can listen and then repeat if you want. Aim Hrim Om Saraswati Namaha Aim Hrim Om Saraswati Namaha mm. So in the Vedic tradition, which is the tradition that I have learned and lived in for the last almost 20 years, the Vedic tradition is alive and intact in India and also in Bali. These are Vedic cultures. And I'll speak a little bit about what it means, the essence and the heart of it in a moment. So in the Vedic tradition, every conversation, every undertaking, we always start with prayers. <laughs> we always offer a blessing because we know there are obstacles. Whatever we start whatever we do there are obstacles we don't know if we're gonna get what we want if we can accomplish and achieve the desired result so when we do a little prayer before whatever we're doing we are invoking grace we're invoking the unseen factor yet the factor is always here to bless this undertaking and to remove the obstacles or to invoke clear communication like we are we just did now invoking Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge. And so that's why we also did that now. <laughs> and in the Vedic tradition, where these mantras come from, these are Sanskrit prayers. And you don't have to know Sanskrit to do a prayer, of course. You can also apply this prayer. If you don't know Sanskrit, just say it in your own language with that same intention. I'm invoking the unseen factor, I'm invoking the universe, I'm invoking a higher power to bless this undertaking, to bless this dialogue, to bless this new day. It can be in your specific mother tongue, which is very powerful actually. Yet for some of us, we have a little bit of resistance towards prayers, like me. I had a lot of resistance towards prayers many years ago because automatically I related prayers to Christianity and I didn't have a good relationship. I didn't have a healthy, empowering relationship and an introduction um, to Christianity. Mm. 
So I was rejecting all kinds of religion very, very strongly. And I thought that all religion are the same. They just want to suppress you. They just want to control, they want to control you and suppress you. And they're inducing fear into humans so that they, they have more power over us. And then I understood that not all uh, religions, which I don't really call a Vedic tradition a religion, it's really a spiritual heritage. And so what is the difference between a religion and spirituality? Religion is, the way we defined it, something that we believe in, something that we believe in, and spirituality, or the spiritual heritage of the Vedic tradition, is knowledge. Mm. It's the inquiry into reality, what is really real. And so when it comes to knowledge or that which is really real, we call that truth. Mm. What is the truth? And so that which is truthful cannot change subject further inquiry and is also not something to believed in. So like, there's a big distinction between religion and spirituality. Religion, that which something we believe in, like we believe in God and in spirituality, we're not believing in God, we know God. <laughs> we want to know God, we want to know what God is. And we want to know God as ourselves, not as a God, a being that is away from us. So once I understood that, and I started to have a very different relationship to prayers, because I understood with the help of the Vedic teachings and with my teacher, I understood that I'm not praying from the standpoint, oh, I'm a weak person and I'm seeking redemption and I'm seeking to be saved because that was like the initial relationship I had to prayers. I'm half Filipina and my Philippine family is quite religious. And in the Philippine, we would go to the church and it never felt good in the church. There was this like feeling like I'm, I'm weaker and I have to seek redemption. I'm, I'm a sinner, basically. Mm-hmm. And so that wasn't empowering at all. So when I came to the Vedic tradition and to spirituality, I was told and taught <laughs> that I'm not a weak person. I'm the most powerful being like everyone else. We are powerful beings, but we don't know. And until I know that I am most powerful, like all other beings are also equally powerful. You are powerful and I am powerful. We're all equally powerful. No one is above or below anyone. That's a big one like to discover. So we are praying to, to a higher power until I understand that I am equally powerful. So I'm invoking that power that I think I don't have. And so there's so many nuances to it. And I love, I really love to go into depths and really understand the nuances. And that is what I have been doing the last almost 20 years. I, I made radical decisions and I did. There was a, a fire in me and it's still there, a strong burning fire, a fire of passion, a desire to know truth. And that desire to know truth, it led me to go to India when I was very young at 18 years old, seeking truth, like what is really truth and left behind my life in Switzerland. And people say, yes, you are radical, you are extreme. And I never really saw myself as an extreme person, but I am kind of extreme, it's true. And and there was also, it was very important to get out of extremes. And so finding that balance, which the yoga is all about really is to find that balance. But then what is extreme, right? It's relative. What is extreme for me might not be extreme for you or what is extreme for you might not be extreme for me. So yes, I made radical choices and I am glad I did. I'm glad because it brought me to where I am today. I stayed in India. And if you want to know more about my first experience in India, I invite you to check out my podcast. It's called Born to be Free. And you can find it on Spotify and on YouTube. And I share about my journey to India, my first spiritual awakening that I had in India in quite detail there. So I'm not going to go into that right now. But I did have a spiritual awakening and it did lead me to seek, to really 
commit to the path of freedom, to commit to the path of moksha, we call it. Moksha means freedom to the path of truth. So that spiritual awakening, which was what? For me in that moment, it was the, the understanding, the realization that we are God, that we are all one, really. When I said we are God, what I mean with that is that we are actually in reality whole and complete and a sacred being, and there's nothing profane about ourselves, one. And two, it means that we are not only whole as the person, but we are also the whole, which means we are the whole universe. We are everything. So that is the vision of oneness, the vision of wholeness, the truth of wholeness. And so that I had that experience in India when I was 18 years old. But like that's the big but it was an experience. So I was tripping for quite a while and really having this experience of oneness. But it was an experience and the nature of experience is they go, they change. Like an experience is not something that I can hold on to. Experiences, they come and they go. Like states of experiences, they come and they go. Like I go, I'm awake and then I go have a dream and then I sleep and I wake up. And then throughout the day when I'm in the waking state, there are countless experiences. I'm going from one experience to another experiences and these experiences are constantly changing. And so I was trying to hold on to this feeling, this state of oneness, this state of bliss, but it lasted very long, <laughs> but I couldn't hold on to it. Like eventually it did disappear. Eventually I was just back being myself, myself, the part that I identified with that is limited and an isolated being, I grew up in Switzerland, I'm half Filipina, so I'm from dual culture. And so I experienced very deeply the cultural wound, the wound um, of, of separation. We all experience the wound of separation, like that's the core wound for all of us human beings. And then there are many levels of this wound of separation that we experience. And so if we've had like a healthy family system, um, it will play out less. But many of us, we grew up in dysfunctional family, we grew up maybe dual culture, triple culture, or not even, but even within the same culture, so many of us don't feel whole and that we belong in that particular culture. And so also many people have experienced divorce. And so all of these experiences, they add to this wound of separation. And that was the case as well in my, in my situation. Um, the original wound of separation, which the Vedic tradition talks about, and then the relative, all the relative experiences that are fundamentally, yes, coming from the original wound, but then additionally, we have all these additional dramas and stories which intensify this wound. And that is because of different cultures, different color, the discrimination of race, the discrimination, discrimination of gender, the discrimination of religion and beliefs, and the discrimination of status, you know, the wells, um, all of that adds to us feeling separated and different from each other. Because in, in Western culture, where I grew up, we look at what we do not have in common. Like we look at ourselves and we compare ourselves to everyone else. And we look at through the glasses of separation or the glasses of good and bad, basically. We don't see the wholesomeness, unless we do, unless you grew up in a spiritual family, then that would be different, but most of us can. And so in India, India and like Bali, it's, it's a Vedika culture, it's the Vedic culture. And they also, of course, are affected by the wound of separation. But, now there's the big but, they have still a spiritual heritage, they still have spiritual wisdom, the Vedas. So the Vedas is a body of knowledge, a body of knowledge that is like a map for human beings to discover wholeness, to discover happiness, to discover security, and eventually freedom, to be free from this wound of separation. That, that's the whole point, that's the whole purpose of the spiritual heritage, the spiritual teachings of the Vedic tradition. 
And so when I was in India and I experienced this and was immersed in a culture that many people live in, live through their daily activities and have adapted an attitude that goes along with the vision of oneness. So what is the difference when you're growing up in a culture that lives from the wound of separation or living in a culture that lives from the wound, uh, not the wound, but the truth of union, like in, in the culture where we are living based on separation, we are constantly in competition. So we're in a, living in a competitive society. And in the Vedic culture in India and Bali, where we don't have the same belief that, that we are a separate being, an incomplete sinful being and different from the whole God, there the vision is that we are whole and complete and that my being is the being of everyone. So we are born from wholeness and we are born sacred. And so the, the society is a contributing society. Western society, competitive society. Eastern or India, Bali, it's a contributing society. It's a society that contributes, that is not here to compete because they don't see themselves as different than others. They see themselves as I am you and you are me. And so we are here to support each other. Mm -hmm. Of course, you may tell me, like many tell me, but Sharada, I go to India and Bali and there is also jealousy and there's also competition and they're also lying so strongly. Yes, I know. I also experienced all of that. And, you know, the culture has been influenced by many, many other cultures. Right? So the Mongols have come, the Muslims have come, the, the Christians have come, and colonization has happened. So it's not pure in that sense anymore. The, the tradition, like it's, it's, it's um, infiltrated. It has been, it has been influenced by other cultures and religions and traditions. So naturally, not everyone is living, but every Vedic person really, like in the heart of heart, in the heart of heart, like there is a sentiment, a spiritual sentiment, and they know that they are whole and complete and that they are sacred. Some part in them knows that. Also the stories that they grew up with, like the Mahabharata, and the great story, or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Puranas, all these sacred stories that the Vedic culture has, which is this infinite well of knowledge and wisdom to learn from these stories. Like how better can we learn um, than through storytelling? And so that storytelling tradition is very, very much alive in India and in Bali. There in Bali, for example, there are often in the evenings there are the, there are coming together. The village comes together, and they have their banjar. The banjar is like the place where where the community comes together, or then the temples. Like there are more temples than houses in Bali, for example, and the people come together and dance the stories, sing the stories, and so the people grow up with these uh, mythological stories of of. Of, for example, Saraswati, the goddess the, of the mantra that we chanted to Saraswati. So the Saraswati has a story, or of Rama. Rama is the great king, the one that, the dharmic warrior, the one that is upholding sacred universal values. And so then people learn through the storytelling. And basically, these stories are all, are all the stories of all possible human psychology scenarios. Mm -hmm. Because in the Vedic tradition, in the Vedic teachings, we say nothing ever happens new. Everything is repeating itself. And so our life is like a repetition. So it's not a linear. It, and they don't believe that we only are here since 2024 years. <laughs> in the Vedic tradition, we look at the nature of this world and the nature of our experiences in cyclical form. And so, like everything else, is cyclical. And so it's really timeless, our existence. And so there are countless stories. And the stories also are told not just in, from one life, but the stories go into another life and another life. It's fascinating. It's incredible. It's, it's such a, it's a well, a well of wisdom and wisdom knowledge that literally 
has saved my life and has protected me and also has empowered me in every possible way. And without the Vedic tradition, without the spiritual heritage of Indian Bali, I would not be here today. It literally has saved, protected and empowered me in every possible way. And so because I know it has done that for me, I know it can do that for you as well. Mm. And so it requires a boldness. It requires a, a fire, like that fire that I talked about at the beginning that, that I have in my solar plexus, like that desire to wanting to live a purposeful, meaningful life, that desire to, to live in truth, to know what truth is, to know am I this sinful, incomplete being or am I like what the Veda says, what all spiritual traditions say, no, you're a whole and complete and sacred being. And if we don't like ask for it, if we don't go for it, we know exactly what the result is and how our life is. It's the life that most of us have experienced or are still experiencing a life of pain, a life of profound suffering, a life of profound dissatisfaction. And it's incredible, like no matter what we have, we are not satisfied. Mm -hmm. We ask each other, how are you? And, we, and then we give an answer, yeah, I'm good. It's a beautiful day, but, and the but comes very quickly. Right? And then there are hundred reasons why I'm not well, hundred reasons for my complaints, hundred reasons for my jealousy, hundred reasons reasons from for blaming. And and that's not a life that that we deserve. <laughs> we all deserve to live a profoundly meaningful, truthful life, abundant life. That's what the Veda wants for us. That's what the Vedic vision and the Vedic teachings has as its core intention. Not that it really has an intention because it's not a being that has an intention, but it's the truth and the spiritual heritage of the Vedic tradition has the capacity to help us really live a happy abundant, empowered, sacred and magical life. It is really possible. And then what is important is that you say, this is what I want. I am worthy of that. I deserve to live a happy life. I deserve to have a, a loving, kind, caring relationship. So many people are in unhealthy relationships. I know so many, also myself, I've been in unhealthy relationships. And then we settle for less out of the fear of being alone, for being alone. And so we settle with a mediocre person. Not that the person is mediocre, that person is also whole and complete and sacred, but there's so much pain. And so they cannot express the love and the care. And so then I want the love and the care from a person who does not love and care for themselves. I seek validation from the people and the surrounding who do not validate themselves. And so the only person that can truly love and care for yourself is yourself. And once you really do that, once you really, really care and love yourself, empower yourself, the surrounding will also do that. The, the surrounding, my life is a reflection of my inner world. My inner world is a reflection of my outer world. And so the people that are there right now, they are your sacred mirrors. And they do the best they can. Maybe it's terrible, but it's the best they can. And it's up to you to say, like, this relationship has served its purpose. Or this relationship is actually exactly what I need. And it shows me where I need to grow, where I have projected my happiness my security unto someone other than myself. Mm -hmm. So relationships are meant for growth. Like life, your experience, the world, 
is meant for growth that has to be very, very clear. Relationships, life, experiences, they are not meant to make you happy. Like, and that's a big one. Because everyone believes that the world and the relationship and money can make us happy. That's what we all grew up with. At least most of us, like, who has watched Cinderella and Pretty Woman and Snow White. Those are the stories that we grew up with. Like, those are our myths that we grew up with. That I need to be saved and I will be saved by the prince. And then I will live happy ever after, happily ever after. So that's the story we grew up with. And so now that's the story that is playing out in our lives again and again and again. <sighs> Those stories, they, they are like seeds. And then you know, like seeds, they are deep down in the earth. And seeds can be very powerful. They sprout and they grow roots. Mm -hmm. And so those stories that have been planted in our unconscious, in our mind, by media, by people, by the school, they have grown roots and they're very, very deep. And so like what has flourished from that is unhealthy relationships, toxic relationships, a job that you do because you've been told that this job is the ultimate satisfaction. To become a bank director, to become a lawyer, to become a doctor, to become a CEO, to become a millionaire. Those are the stories that we have been told that this is what I need to be in order to be happy. I need to have this much money, I need to become a millionaire then I am a successful person. Like whatever the stories are that you've been told, they are playing out right now in your life. How can we know that we choose the right person? Well, if you are with the person right now, like it's the right person because that person is teaching you right now something about you. So like the right person, it is ultimately like depending on, on your values, like what is your value? What do you want to gain from the relationship? Right? So, so many people, like they come together as a couple, they go into a relationship with this idea, with these deep rooted beliefs that we are going to make each other happy. And so if we both have this belief, it works for some time, sometimes even for years and sometimes even for lifetime lives. But at one point, this will fall apart, this belief. It won't uphold. And then, but even that was the right person for that time being, right? because at that time, that was my belief and that was my intention, that was my desire. We are completing each other. We're making each other happy. We are fulfilling each other's desires and it works. And so at that time, it was the right person for me. right? And then once we understand, once we woke up that actually no person can make me happy. I have false expectations. I have false, actually even like a conditional love. Then my desire is to meet a person that also has this view and also wants to engage in a relationship that is meant for growth, to discover, to become sacred mirrors to each other. Sacred mirror means like a mirror where I can see where I have made wrong judgments about myself, where I have projected my happiness and my security onto someone else. And so then I can come back and hold that part in me. It's most of the time the little one, like the little ones, the little girl or little boy that concluded that she is not lovable, that he is not lovable, that she or he is the cause of suffering. Mm -hmm. Because of our upbringing, maybe the parents fault, and then the little girl is, is constantly trying to 
repair this relationship of the parents, but it's incapable of doing that. And so then he starts to make a judgment upon herself or himself or themselves, thinking that they are the cause of pain. And so then that is a belief that goes very deep into the unconscious. And then it can play out again in our adult life. And then you're in a relationship with a person and you don't feel secure in that relationship. You feel that you are causing them pain. You're not secure. You are become very needy. We become very attached to this person. And just the thought of them leaving us, uh, total paralyzation, is that the English word? Paralyzation, like I'm totally paralyzed. Like I remember when I, I had so strong guards up my whole life until, until I met the man, that one, that really, that really broke my heart open and before then, I, I had very good survival skills. So I didn't let anyone really into my heart. All the men's I had, I was more in my masculine shell and made sure they would not be able to hurt me. But then when I met the man that asked me to marry him, I totally fell in love with this guy. And I became the most needy, most attached person. The truth is, I didn't become the needy and attached person. The truth is that needy and attached person, that person that became so attached, was already there. That little girl, she was always there, but she was in exile. She was sent away, far, far away. And she only appeared when I let down my guards, when he married me, like marriage is this promise. We're going to stay together forever and ever. You will be by my side forever and ever. You will never leave me. We'll always be together. And like this kind of promises, this kind of vows and him totally in love with me and seeing the queen in me and the goddess in me and the first man that like really truly worshiped me as a goddess. I was so taken by this relationship and that little girl, she just like pff, exploded. And so basically, like, and so that person was then the right person as well, because without him, I would not have had the chance to meet that little girl that was there all along. Like I got married in my 20s. And so that little girl was there all along, that little girl that... Um, was heartbroken because her parents divorced and that little girl that was heartbroken because her dad died from cancer and that little girl that was heartbroken because my mom was not emotionally equipped to handle a death and 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 the family situation mm. so all this pain was stored for many many years in my unconscious we call it the kashayam in the sanskrit in the vedic tradition the, the kashayam it's very deep, deep in the underworld. And then a partner, a person comes into our life when we're grown ups and we let down our guard. We fall in love. And then this part that have been rescued at that time when we were not able to handle that painful situation, mm -hmm. the divorce or the death, it's too much for a little girl, a little boy. So that's the intelligence of the universe. It has created the unconscious. It saves the child so that the child doesn't need to experience this in this moment, but it goes into like the unconscious. We forget about it. And then as an adult where we fall in love, this surfaces. Because if I know that I'm a whole and complete and wonderful being, I can love my, the person freely, unconditionally. Like they can do or not do, they can do and be wherever they want. I'm not dependent on them fully. Right? They can go, we can be apart for a week or not. We can live in separate houses. I remember when my husband suggested that we would have separate houses because we had so much triggers and so much pain coming up. I totally freaked out. Totally freaked out. It was like, the death, like how can he suggest to live in separate houses? <laughs> and then 10 years later, I suggested it to my partner. 
<laughs> he took it much better than I did. I couldn't take it at that time because I interpreted it as he doesn't want to be with me anymore. That's what I interpreted. But he just wanted to give us space so that we could be with our heart and with the unconscious and process the pain. And the interesting thing is at that time when I got married, I already knew about projections and and the little ones and I understood I already had a desire. We actually got married with that desire and that intention. May we come together for a higher purpose. Right? So I also that's when I the first time went into a relationship with that intention. We come together, we call it moksha sadhana partner, so partners in sadhana in, in spiritual for a spiritual purpose, for moksha. Moksha means freedom. So our marriage was a, a shaptapati, was a seven-step ritual where we took each step dedicated to health and dedicated to dharma, dedicated to true friendship. And we were even married by my teacher. So it was a very beautiful marriage. And like that was the intention. We come together for a higher purpose. And I didn't think like that it would go so quickly. <laughs> But it went very quickly because like our intention, they can be very powerful. We call it the Sankalpa Shakti. If we have trust, if we have, and if we add prayers, our intentions, they can fructify very quickly. Life can change very quickly. The universe sometimes takes its time, but sometimes it can like, boof, okay, you ask for it and here it is. And now you get to do the work. And, and that's how it was in my case with, with that marriage. We, we had the intention for moksha sadhana partner and boof thing. all the projections became very obvious and jealousy came up and neediness came up and this was this great opportunity to then really meet the unconscious which is the little ones and hold myself and we then at the end separated because it was too much at that time we couldn't hold our container because like in those times when it's so painful Sometimes you say things that you do not want to say. Sometimes we even do things that we do not want to do, but we do them because we're so helpless. Like we suddenly say you're such a, like swear words or we even like, I was so helpless. I was so angry. Like an anger is just helplessness. I was so afraid that he would leave me. Like out of that despair, he, I, I would take the drum and I took the drum and I would just smash it. Right. Like that, that, that anger had to come out, but that was not a healthy way that the anger came out. Yeah. The healthy way would be, okay, I'm going to go and take the pillow and consciously bring out this anger. And so like I, I already knew I had a lot of understanding already and knowledge, but then to embody it at that time, like I'm, I'm talking now uh, more than 10 years ago, like I already knew but I couldn't embody it at that time. And so that requires a lot of compassion, right? To be compassionate with myself and you get to be compassionate with yourself because we all know, right? We, we know a lot, but then to really apply it in life, to embody it, it's, it requires the dragon heart, and the warrior heart that I'm going to do it. And, and even though we feel like smashing and saying swear words in this moment we're not going to do it because we know it's just going to make everything worse mm. and so in my in the, after the relationship it after when i divorced i was celibate for four years i didn't have a relationship for four years because i said i never want this to happen again and i'm going to take care of my heart i made a decision then i'm going to do the inner child work no matter what I'm going to go to therapy no matter what. I'm going to chant these mantras no matter what. I'm going to do it. Right? And so for four years, I didn't, I didn't have a relationship. And I really took care of my heart. I do wish a little bit in retrospect that I would have given more emphasis and more importance to self-love rituals. Even though I was already in my like, S-E-X, I cannot say this word, otherwise it kind of gets banned, but S-E-X, like the act because of which we all exist, <laughs> S-E-X. Um, I already was in my own S-E-X healing at that time. I had a Tantra teacher and everything, but 
like the pain was so overwhelming that I didn't really apply those SCX lovemaking, self lovemaking uh, rituals. I was just focusing on the mantras and then the child work and the therapy, which was amazing. But like the body partly was still frozen. And now, like, I really, really encourage all my students and, and the people I mentor, uh, we really focus on the, on the self care, self love rituals because. With the self-love rituals, um, we we also go into the body and help to unfreeze and rewire the nervous system and give like give an, a medicine that is so profoundly powerful. Like SEX pleasure rituals are so profoundly powerful when we go through deep, deep pain, actually. But the thing is, when we go through so much deep pain, often we do not want to do the self-care rituals. Because the parts in us are resisting it. They are screaming. They want to go into the fight. They want to blame. They want to create havoc. They want to create drama. Because like, many of us were also attached to, to the drama. It, it kind of makes us feel alive. And that's again, we, we grew up with soap opera. And so then in the movie, right? In the movie. And then also in the, at home. And that, that's the difference. Again, in Vedic tradition, the heroes are very different. It was not Cinderella. The heroes in the Vedic tradition is Sarasati and Durga, and they deal with their difficulties very different. And yes, there is also pain and suffering, but then they have these spiritual tools and practices that they use and apply in the stories that we learn in the Vedic tradition from, so that I don't repeat the same story again like my parents, but that I'm ch uh, ch um, neutralizing the the pain and not perpetuating it. And so all these self-care rituals, like they're really powerful. And that's why now in all my containers, in my mentorship, they are included. And and especially I encourage you, if you don't want to do it, and that's actually with anything in life. <laughs> like if you don't want to do it, most of the time, you really, 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 really need it. Like, and my teacher is hardcore and one of my teachers, and he would say, if you don't want to go to the altar, you have to go a hundred thousand times more, actually. Right? Because when I don't want to go to the altar, I'm still, I'm resisting. I still want to blame the world. I still want to blame my partner for not making the dishes, for not doing what I want him or her, them to do. I'm blaming the president or I'm blaming the weather. Right? And so I'm, I'm carrying all of this blame and anger and pfft, I'm like a walking volcano which is so uncomfortable to be around like that's why then everyone just runs away from you because you're like pfft, walking volcano but then as sadhan is that we go to the altar and we unload this volcano we like erupt and and the altar is a safe place to erupt because like Sarasvati, Durga or however you want to call the goddess the god the universe they don't get upset. They don't, they're not going to make a judgment of them upon themselves and think like, oh, now you're hurting me and I must be a terrible person that you are erupting. No, they are just like cool, calm and collected. And they're actually celebrating you. Like you see that in their faces. Like th Their faces is like, yeah, smile. You go, girl. You go being. Just go and bring it on. Right? You have Kali and, and she's there with her tongue and the blood everywhere and wearing skulls around her neck as a as a necklace and she's like yeah bring it on right? but if you erupt as that volcano in front of your husband or children or mother there most of them are not going to cheer you on <laughs> then my 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 reason my 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 beloved friend uh Yusuf with whom I uncoupled a beautiful story like we would cheer each other on when we got angry so we we're like yeah bring it on like but then but we didn't get angry at each other we would then go together to the altar or just bring it out in an embodiment ritual or in sounds so then that's the beauty of being in a conscious relationship in a in a spiritual relationship because then you both know that this stuff is there and you both support each other to bring this stuff out and so that's the difference and so I'm giving you a very long answer to the question. <laughs> How do I know uh, if it's the right person? So basically everyone is the right person at that particular time and they are your sacred mirror and they show you where you need to grow.
right so and then of course i would say like ultimately like the right person is really at that time when you really have this both this deep commitment to to growth to freedom and then eventually like eventually the main relationship will be with god will be with the goddess because that's the only relationship that cannot fail all human relationships will will fail eventually because we're humans and we don't know everything and we cannot be there all the time 24/7 so like there is this this maturing process where we slowly or fastly depending on your on your fire and your passion or your burning desire to gain freedom like the more we're dedicated to this spiritual sadhanas the more we repeat them and practice them the more i will see the result naturally like if i practice once a week that's amazing already like amazing i'm cheering you on right but if i practice for example twice a week or three times a week it's it's going to be stronger because like these old seeds that were planted these stories these patterns this unhealthy behavior or violent communication they're like deeply rooted and in order to neutralize and take out the roots and plant new seeds we get to do new actions so new sadhanas new practices new samskaras and and these new samskaras these new actions are so important because the repetition of them what are those for example chanting a mantra like we did because when you're chanting a mantra the only time when you know what you're going to say because every all other times you never know what thoughts are going to come thoughts are just coming you don't have any control over your thoughts really but with mantras one of the many many blessings there are countless i teach all of that in my courses is that we become the, the master of our mind and that's the greatest mastery right to to become the master like the loving master the the the, the like 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 the way we learning to play an instrument we're learning to play our mind and then our mind becomes this most exquisite instrument to for me to enjoy my own mind and for other people as well and that's on many different levels so mantra is incredibly powerful it's a it's a karma it's an action and it neutralizes old karma and creates new karma healthy karma spiritual karma spiritual wealth really and also other practices like yoga asana of course pranayama meditations and then all the self love uh, rituals and um pujas like different rituals that are there so many countless uh, karmas that are there so mantra yantra tantra um yoga like all of these are different sadhanas and they all belong to the vedic tradition they are not segregated paths really like the tantra the mantra the yantra the kriya they're all they're all sisters and brothers the ayurveda they all go together the jyotish and they're all one big family and they are like your your spiritual family because they want you because we have like we have like yoga you think like how does the yoga want me to succeed well because we have the one that represents the yoga who is that shiva like right? so shiva he's the yogi of all yogi and then you have lalita tripura sundari she is the the tantrika like and she wants it to ex- ex- exub- exuberate and bring out your erotic fullness and then you have hanuman like and, and he represents the the devotion and the one that is intelligent and strong um also another yogi another gnani and so all these different sadhanas like they all have representatives <laughs> like saraswati and durga and and they become they have become my spiritual family they have become my family that wants the best for me it's the family that i always wished i would have had you know i love and adore my mother my father my stepfather everyone like but they couldn't empower me the way i needed to be empowered your parents most probably couldn't empower you the way you needed to be empowered like in certain aspects yes very deeply certain aspects very much but not in all aspects and so i cannot blame my parents i mean i can and i have but at one point we got to stop right they are my sacred mirrors and in the vedic tradition we say that most probably i was their parents <laughs> that i have done to them what they are doing to me and so then i can take responsibility and i i become that mother that father 
and until I am that mother and father that I need in order to be an empowered human being, I have Shiva, I have Durga, I have these this gods and goddesses that are here to protect me, that are here to empower me, that are here to, to celebrate me. And so that's, that's the well, this priceless well of the Vedic, of the Vedic tradition, the spiritual heritage of India and of Bali that I have been in for the last 20 years. And it's, it's my deepest passion to share this with, with you and with my students. I've created Devi schools and I've been invited to many different yoga teacher trainings to teach the philosophy. Um, we are we're going to have Vaidika Dharma a yoga teacher training, actually, like she's also fully ste steeped in the Vedic tradition. And we're going to have a yoga teacher training in Bali in November. So if you want to become a yoga teacher and like share these stories and this wisdom and bring that into yoga, come to Bali and join us. I have my priestess initiation training. If you love about rituals and want to become a, a ceremonialist, I have my priestess initiation in Bali in March. And then I have a very, very special retreat, immersion really, which is called the Nectar of You here in Portugal, where I am at right now. Uh, I decided to stay here. Usually I live in Bali since 16 years, but I'm here right now in Al Jazeera because I have my first uh, immersion in, in Portugal. And it's a very special immersion because it's really the culmination of, of these 20 years of healing my relationship to the feminine, but also very deeply now to the, to the masculine. Because I've been paying a lot, a lot of attention to the feminine. A lot of my work has been with working with women. I have an online school also where I uh, do a, a Devi coach certification program where I train people to become a, a coach, a, a trauma-informed, devoted, embodied, Vedantic, integrated coach. It's a one-year program, but it's for women. And that's where we go through the, the healing of our SEX, and then the SEX empowerment and the SEX magic. It's so, this was so crucial for my own journey to really heal my, my identity as a woman and my experience as a woman. But then there was also this aspect of my relationship to men. And this is, has been a huge journey for me. And I decided last year on my birthday, it was my 40th birthday last year that I want to do a ceremony. I want to really honor this passage from the 30th to the 40th. And so I did a, a four day ceremony with 40 people, 40 people, four day, honoring my 40th birthday. And my intention was to really deeply, fully heal my relationship to the masculine. <laughs> right? I want to fully get out of these unhealthy relationship patterns. My last relationship was so beautiful, so healthy in so many ways, the one with Joseph. We were together six years, but still there was still some subtle power dynamics going on that were unhealthy. And, 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 and we really did the best we could to neutralize that, but we weren't fully able to do that. And so we decided together in love, in friendship to uncouple. And it was the most beautiful experience and most healing experience to actually let each other go in love, in gratitude and be there for each other and empower each other in our own healing to the feminine, to the masculine. And so I joined the mentorship program, a huge mentorship program to really support this decision. And I thought I would go back to Bali after my birthday, but I made this intention. I'm going to heal. I want to heal my relationship to the masculine. And then life, boof. You know? That's why I say it's so powerful. The power of our Sankalpa, Shakti Sankalpa. It Then this intention, it made me stay in and first of all, it brought me to America. I, I went on a journey. I went to visit my teacher in America. And then I went to Phoenix and Sedona and Las Vegas. Crazy story. But I went to this big festival, Arcadia. And I just went on my own, on my hero's heron's journey, like the fourth time, <laughs> like the hero heron's journey. I don't know how many times we do it, but this was again one. And I went and I just went onto this mission, like really, like what is this pain with the masculine, this mistrust? And why am I not like fully yet fully in my own healthy masculine? Like, and that also was playing out in my relationship to money mm. because our relationship to the masculine is very much connected to our relationship to money, the provider. And so I went to this journey. I went back to Portugal and then I went to this big event, an ecstatic remembrance event. And I signed up for a six months, huge mentorship program. I spent so much money. I spent basically all my money on a mentorship program because I knew this is going to be big. 
like this phase, if I integrate this part, my expansion is just going to go. And it was like that. Right? But I invested, I had to invest time, money. I didn't go back to Bali. I stayed in Switzerland. I went back to Switzerland for the first time after 22 years. And I was on top of the mountain all by myself in the snow, that which I was rejecting the most. I had to face it. Like my fear of cold, my fear of the mountains, my stepdad. <laughs> and then my first boyfriend came back into my life. He came back after 30 years, he came back and I had to, I got to face this deep pain of the 13 year old girl. I speak about that in my podcast in Born to be Free, about how I committed suicide and at 13 years old because I was so lost and that trauma that he and I experienced at that time. And so really like the universe said, okay, you asked for it. Here it is. Heal your relationship to the masculine and boof. You know, and so much has has burst from that. Like I joined this huge mentorship program, but I also created a huge mentorship program, which is called the Diamond. And I launched it at the same time. I had 10 people in the Diamond, writers, filmmakers, uh, SEX coaches, mothers, um, birth practitioners. And we just like expanded so much together. Like so everything that I went through, this is like for me, many things I really like the Vedanta, the Vedic tradition, I studied for many years and then I kind of, I always shared it because that was, was what I was encouraged to do by my teacher. Like you share what you're learning in gratitude, in love, and, and you make other people study with you. So for me, like to share what I learn, it's the most powerful way to really integrate it. It really gets embodied. So like some people maybe question that, but for me, it really has worked. So I, like my own sexual healing, SEX healing with the masculine and then joining this huge mentorship program with a person so that I am supported to this big process and I created my own big program. And so like with all of this, like to show like the decisions we make in life, they can be so tough. The intentions we make, they can be so powerful. Things can change overnight and it can be so scary. But then we have, we can have, we need people around us that can support us. Like we nobody, no great saint, no great teacher, no great mentor. You ask, you, you name it. Everyone has support. Right? The hero, the heroine, everyone has allies. We are not meant to do this by ourselves. Forget it. Drop it. Right? We're all here to support each other and contribute to each other. That's that's the goal. That's the purpose of our existence. To help each other remember who and what we are. Yeah. that you are me and I am you and we are one being, one whole and complete being, that there's absolutely no difference in any way between you and I. <sighs> fearlessness, we call it, abhayam. Because that's all we want is fearlessness. And you are it. Every fear you experience, that's not who you are. The fear that you experience is in your mind and in your body. Right? And it's tough. Right? If you've had SEX trauma, which I had, it's there in the body. Like it took me so many years to be in gender, mixed gender, SEX retreats and trainings because I only had to be with women. It was freaking out with men. So, so it's stored in the body. We need safe spaces. We need support. We need to release the trauma in the body and in the mind, but then ultimately, like no matter the healing, no matter the modality, like the fear will always be de there to a certain extent in your body and your mind, right? Because the body is going to die. It is born, it will die. So you will experience at the level of the body, some kind of fear and the mind also, right? Because we are all traumatized by a religion or various religion that have ingrained in our being that we are sinners and guilty. And so like the mind will never completely, perfectly be pure in its essence. Yes. So we have all these modalities. These are crucial and we use them, but then ultimately like it is knowledge. It is truth of your essential nature that will free you and the discovery that your essence, your truth, yourself is fearlessness. 
yourself never ever experiences any fear in any way. This is so big. And right now it might just blow your mind, but that's the whole point of the Vedic tradition. It meant to blow our minds in the most loving ways. Right? So the self, your tr yourself, not some higher self, not even some capital S self, yourself, that being that is most known, most intimate, most dear to you, that self is fearlessness itself. The nature of the self is fearlessness. The nature of the self is deathlessness. The nature of the self is unchangeable, unshakable, unbreakable, undryable, unwettable, unburnable. It's Aksharam Brahma. It's indestructible being. That is your nature. That's the truth. And so no matter what you have experienced in your life, no matter the trauma, it is not you. With your mom, with your dad, with the, all the unhealthy relationships that you've had because of the dysfunctional family, it is not you. Mm. And so my, my immersion is coming up. It's called the Nectar of You. And some of you maybe think I'm crazy because I changed them like three times <laughs> because I've been doing the sacred woman trauma-informed sacred SEX retreat for many years, which was only for women. And I will do it again next year for sure for women only. But for this year, it came through so strongly that I'm not meant to do that one. Instead, I meant to make space for the nectar of you, which is this immersion seven days for men and women and non-binary folks to go from separation to sacred union. And so, yes, it involves sacred SEX rituals, but they're mainly with you. And then the last day that will be shared if wanted solo or it can be in partner. But I will bring in like bring in my journey and the teachings of the Vedas and the SEX sacred SEX rituals that really help one to rewire the nervous system with pleasure, release the trauma but also use pleasure to rewire the nervous system in, a, in, in this container where men and women and non-binary are welcomed. And this is another level, like another depth when there's mixed gender. And so it's not for everyone because some of us, we still need the solo women spaces only. Like me, I needed them for 10 years or actually, like I was only with women before I dared to go into mixed gender. But then the piece to be with mixed gender, it was crucial and fundamental now to conclude this healing with the masculine. And that was my intention, right? On my 30th birthday, I want to heal my relationship to the masculine. And so now this last year I was in, in mixed gender spaces and it was the culmination. And that's why I know this immersion has to be mixed gender. And then next year I'll do again for women only and then both. I don't want to do too many because I really like quality and presence and I don't have the capacity of a manifesting generator who can do so much. I, I get to be very careful with my energy. So I see myself doing the nectar view for mixed gender and one uh, sacred woman's retreat and then the priestess in Bali and my yoga teacher training, but there I'm very much supported with Daniela and others. So basically, Yes, if if you feel called, um, you're so warmly invited to come to Portugal, either solo and because like it's the topic is femininity and masculinity and the sacred union. You can come solo. You can also come in a couple. You will have a special prize for a couple. I'm changing the things on the landing page. There needs to be quite some update because all of this has culminated now. Um, so just give me a day or two and it will be updated. But you already have some information. Um, and if you feel like you want to be in a mentorship program, like the one I told you that I entered because I went through this huge change and transition in my life, I'm opening the diamond again in a month, um, actually in six weeks to give some more time. There we will also have a group mentorship online. So there I'm available uh, three, three times a month. We have live sessions mentorship, mastermind, embodiment rituals, and also legacy pot meetings, plus almost daily support on Telegram to really support you through a life transitions that you're going. Like the people that joined last time in the Diamond were people that were divorcing, uh, career change, um, wanting to write, or did start writing their book, going on stage. So it was like all big transitions. 
and people that the diamond, my mastermind is really for people that have quite some solid foundation of emotional management, emotional intelligence, have done work, have done trainings, but want to be in a high level container of amazing people to really support each other in our expansion. And so the combination is very powerful. That's what I did myself also this year. I was in the online one-on-one -on -one mentorship, in the group mentorship, and then I went in person. So everything I'm offering to you is what I have gone through. And so the combination is really mwah. And there is a special prize for the diamond and the nectar of you immersion together. You will already find it on the diamond page. Plus included, you get the rain you queen them. Plus, if you join either the diamond or the nectar of you, you get as a bonus the Devi Temple. And the Devi Temple is my membership where I teach every week, every Thursday, I teach the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, which is the sacred text of the Vedic tradition that talks about the story of the war between two families that are experiencing profound jealousy, a competition, and therefore have started a war. And it's basically our life like what we are experiencing, competition, jealousy, and this story liberates us, basically. And I teach it every Thursday in the Devi Temple. Plus, as the bonus, you have 700 hours of material. Like, I've recorded 700 hours of these teachings, of tools, of practices, self-care rituals, uh, the priestess initiation training you get online, also included. It's not the pers in-person one, it's the one in Bali, but you get the whole mm, course that I recorded online. You get it included also in the Devi Temple. So it's it's a whole library, 700 plus hours of teachings, the study of Dharma, the study of Mantra, the study of meditation, the study of the unconscious, the study of the archetypes, uh, sacred prayers, Sanskrit language, uh, embodiment rituals, self-care rituals, the wisdom of trauma. And then you have access to three festivals, three Navaratris with 60 different teachers from around the world. Um, plus manuals, PDFs, like it's really like full packed. And also a community there that is already with me for a long time where we support each other. So that's a bonus if you join the diamond or the nectar of you or both. So basically, um, these are ways to join or come to Bali. Hmm? Vaidika Dharma with Daniela Mandala in November or the Priestess Initiation in March. Or just reach out and there's also a lot of self-paced courses that you can just purchase one course, a smaller course, and do on your own timing. And I'm starting a very special 36-day challenge on Friday. So I'm going to go live here, actually, for 36 days, and I'm going to show you, um, show me, help me, help you, help us to ritualize our life in 36 steps, basically. So it's a very beautiful um, challenge that is Starting on Friday, I will go live every evening, same time, 7, 8 p.m. Central European summertime. And then every day I teach one step. And so we go from morning till night. And I will teach you one mantra for each step. And the meaning, of course, and the mudra and the gesture, which is the mudra, and how to really uh, spiritualize your life. And you spiritualize your life by ritualizing your day. How you live one day is how you live your whole life, basically. And so it starts with one action. And it starts the moment you wake up. And it ends the moment you go to sleep. So I really look forward to this challenge. I invite you to join me and invite your friends. And I have another question here. So true. Can you advise one of the best books for you related to these themes of these amazing traditions, please? Yes. Oh, my God. Um, so many books. You can download the app of teachings of Swami Dayananda app, teachings of Swami Dayananda. There are different Dayanandas. It's the one from the Arsha Vidya Gurukulam that is my lineage. And there, there are many, many books that you can download. And uh, a wonderful one is the Introduction to Vedanta. Um, then another one that I love is Vedic Way of Life, Vedic Way of Life. Um, yoga of, of objectivity is wonderful. It talks about like how we are living in our subjective world and coming back to objectivity. Um, these three are beautiful. So start there. Yeah. Teachings of Swami Dayananda app and each. There are many. There's a lot of free material. And then there's some things that cost two, three dollars. It's not. Uh, it's very affordable. 
um, yeah, and also if you would join, actually you can also join my David Temple as a as a membership to, that is available, or you can join any time. It's like a subscription. You can join for the month, you can join for the year, and you also have access to all this material um, and the live classes. That's only 108 euros per month, actually, very affordable. So that's it that I wanted to share with you. From my heart to yours, deepest gratitude for your presence. May you follow your wildest dreams, live your highest purpose, and expand into the infinite, because that's what you are.